Chapter 1 Fungo Once upon a time, the Wombles went to live on, or rather under, Wimbledon Common in southwest London. There may be other Womble families in different parts of the world. In fact, there are. But the Wombles like to keep themselves to themselves. So once they've made a move and built themselves a comfortable, waterproof burrow, they tend to stay where they are. The head of the Wimbledon Wombles is Great Uncle Bulgaria. He is very old indeed, and his fur has turned snow white, and he feels the cold rather badly. So during the winter months, he mostly sits in his own room in a large rocking chair, wearing a tartan shawl and two pairs of spectacles. He uses one pair for reading the Times newspaper, and the other for looking at young Wombles who have misbehaved. And as this pair makes his eyes look enormous, it has a very alarming effect. Many a young Womble has come out of Great Uncle Bulgaria's room with his or her fur standing up on end and their teeth chattering. As well as the rocking chair, there is a footstool and an electric fire. Years and years ago, when Great Uncle Bulgaria's fur was just turning from grey to white, he had a coal fire, which gave a lot of trouble. If the wind was blowing a certain way, his room used to get full of smoke, which made him cough. And even worse, when the wind was not blowing at all, the smoke went straight up the chimney and up through the bracken, and the common keepers would go and stamp all over the ground, thinking it was a fire in the bushes. And when they did that, pieces of mud fell down the chimney into Great Uncle Bulgaria's room and made a dreadful mess and an even more dreadful smell. So Toba Mori, who was very clever with his paws, made an electric fire out of bits of this and bits of that and it makes the room nice and warm and gives no trouble at all. At last, but very important indeed, there is Great Uncle Bulgaria's Atlas. It is a very large and very old and the pages have gone brown around the edges and some of them have come loose as well. Although Toba Mori has done his best to keep them in place with strips of sticky paper. It's a job which he dislikes because the sticky paper gets stuck to his fur and the more he tries to get it off the more it sticks. So many of the maps have pieces of fur down the sides. The atlas is important because all the Wombles choose their names out of it. Some of them spend a long, long time looking at all the different parts of the world to find just the name that will suit them. And some of them merely shut their eyes really tight and point, hoping for the best. Which is how Bungo got his name. Serves you right said Great Uncle Bulgaria. I don't care. I like it, said Bungo. Ho oh, hum, said Great Uncle Bulgaria. Bungo it is then. Silly sort of name, but it quite suits you. Now then, young Womble, you're old enough to start work, which means you'll be going out onto the common on your own. And that means you'll come across people. And people are very strange creatures. I know, said Bungo. No, you don't. There's a lot you don't know. In fact, there's precious little you do know. Stand up straight and don't slouch. People are strange because they are untidy. Because they sometimes don't tell the truth. And because most of them are so interested in their own affairs, they just don't notice us. If possible, you should avoid them. But if, for one reason or another, you have to speak to a human being, always be polite and helpful. The chances are that they'll never even notice you're a Womble at all. But it's better to be safe than sorry. So don't go looking for trouble. Now, off you go and start work. Bungo indeed. 
and Great Uncle Bulgaria picked up the times and shook out the pages and began to read. So Bungo went off feeling a little foolish, which was most unusual for him, as he was quite certain that he was the bravest and most adventurous and perhaps even the handsomest of all the Wombles. He trotted down the long underground passage, past all the small side turnings, till he came to a door with workshop painted on it. Come in, come in, said Tobermory's gruff voice when Bungo knocked. Bungo had never been in the workshop before, and he went in rather timidly, and his small eyes grew large as he looked about him. It was a big room with rows and rows of shelves all round the walls and each shelf was stacked high with all kinds of things. Gloves, shoes, gumboots, scarves, cameras, balls, rackets, skates, fishing rods, sticks, handbags, wallets, sweaters, socks, jars, bottles, thermos flasks, paper, books, watches, brooches, necklaces, hats, suitcases, raincoats, baskets, buckets, all kinds of money and a lot more besides. All of them in neat piles and each pile neatly labelled. For the Wombles are the tidiest creatures in the world. And if that wasn't enough to be going on with, there were other rooms beyond with racks of larger objects Bicycles and tricycles and scooters, prams and deck chairs, wheels and tables, and even parts of cars and caravans. Well, said Bungo, slowly turning round and round. Aha, said Tobermory, who was taking a radio to pieces on his workbench. His fur was turning grey and he wore a large apron and had a screwdriver tucked behind one ear and a pencil behind the other. Well, 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 said Bungo. What do you think of it, eh? said Tobermory, his sharp eyes looking at Bungo, although his busy paws never stopped working. It's very big, isn't it? said Bungo. And there are such a lot of things. Do they all come from... And he jerked his head towards the ceiling. They, they all do. All left by people out on the common. Pass me that tin marked screws, young Womble. I've got a name now. I'm Bungo. I chose it. Hmm, the sort of name you would choose. Silly sort of name. Yes, all my stores come from the common. Human beings are an untidy lot. They'd lose their legs and arms if they weren't joined on. So, you're old enough to start work, eh? Go and find yourself a basket. Over there, young Womble, on the shelf, marked Baskets. Can't you read? Of course I can, said Bungo, rather hurt. But Tobermory was holding the radio up to his ear and shaking it. It didn't seem to hear, so Bungle sighed and went over to the shelf where he picked out a large straw basket. Nice bit of work that, said Tobermory putting down the radio and looking at the basket. Hardly had to mend it at all when it was brought down to me. Just a stitch or two. Now, remember, young Womble, it's our duty to keep the common tidy. Just do your work properly and mind out for dogs. Dogs do not like Wombles. And Wombles don't take too kindly to dogs. Remember that. Now, off you go. I'm busy. I'm not afraid of dogs, said Bungo. More fool you then, said Tobermory. Shut the door behind you. Bungo had been looking forward to his first working day. For it's the point of a Womble's life, when he feels nearly grown up. He has his own name at last, and he is considered old enough and clever enough to venture into the outside world. In fact, Bungo had spent the last few nights imagining just how important he would feel and what a chance it would be to prove how brave and adventurous he was. But neither Great Uncle Bulgaria nor Tobermory had made any fuss of him. Indeed, they had called his splendid new name 
silly. I'll show him, muttered Bungo, doubling up his paws as he hurried down the passage. And if I meet any dogs, I'll show them too. And he gave a hop, skip and a jump because he suddenly felt excited again. He pretended not to see all the other young Wombles whom he passed and his nose was very much in the air until he reached the main door which opened on to the common. Sitting beside the door and reading a comic very slowly was the night watch Womble Tomsk. He blinked sleepily at Bungo, asked his name and wrote it down carefully in a large book. Then he unlocked the door and opened it at once. Bungo could smell the cool dawn air and hear the birds and a dog barking in the distance. And all at once he didn't feel quite so brave after all. However, he couldn't let Tomsk know that, so Bungo whistled softly to himself and then hummed as the door was shut behind him. And then, very, very slowly, he walked up the last winding passage until there was nothing between him and the outside world but bushes and ferns. Bungo's nose appeared first, and then his bright little eyes, and then his round furry body. As he was not very tall, he couldn't see much except the tops of bushes, which were laced with spider's webs and dew that glittered and danced in the early morning sunlight. Bungo parted the bushes and edged his way between the leaves and grunted to himself as he made for the patch of common which he was to look after. It was not a very large piece but it had got a wooden bench on it, so Bungo knew, from listening to the conversation of the other Wombles, that where there was a seat for human beings, there was also bound to be something to tidy up. He soon noticed some pieces of paper, and within a few seconds, Bungo's paws had picked up two chocolate bar wrappers, a handkerchief with D. Smith on it, and an evening paper. Said Bungo feeling quite a womble of the world. They're an untidy lot, these human beings. <sniffs> Once he started looking, it was really astonishing how much there was to find. A pencil, one half of a return railway ticket to Victoria Station, quite a long piece of string, and a library ticket was soon added to Bungo's collection and he became so pleased with himself that he completely failed to notice two things. First, that the barking dog was getting closer all the time and second, that there was somebody sitting on the bench until just as he was about to seize a rather battered straw boater hat with both eager paws, a voice said, almost in Bungo's horrified ear. And what do you think you may be doing, may I ask? Eep, said Bungo, diving under the seat and covering his ears with his paws. That, said the voice, is my hat, I'll have you know. Bungo opened one eye and looked up and into the eyes of somebody who was leaning right over the edge of the seat and looking down at him. Although the face was, of course, upside down, Bungo recognised it and his heart stopped making a loud banging noise and he said weakly, It was a joke! Poof! It was, said Bungo, climbing out from under the seat and smoothing some of the grass off his fur. I knew it was your hat all the time, Orinoco. Poof! said Orinoco, who was the stoutest and laziest of all the Wimbledon Wombles. He sat back on the bench and put on the straw boater and tilted it over his eyes. 
he was also wearing sunglasses and a long overcoat, rather strained about the middle buttons, and at his side was a walking stick with a very pointed end and an extremely small paper carrier bag, which was quite empty. I'm Bungo now, said Bungo. I always like to sit in the sun, said Orinoco, taking no notice. A bit of sun does you a power of good. Hello, there's a dog coming. What should we do? asked Bungo, starting to tremble and quite forgetting that only a short while ago he had been so brave about dogs. But then he'd only seen a small one before now, and this dog was enormous, with white fur and black spots and a long tongue. Do? I shan't do anything, said Orinoco. I haven't had my forty winks yet. Bungo looked at Orinoco, who had folded his paws across his stomach, and then at the dog, which was racing towards them. And one second later, Bungo, that adventurous and fearless Womble, was running too. Across the grass he went, with his ears back and his breath coming in great gasps until he reached the nearest tree. And up that he clambered until he was lost among the golden yellow leaves. The dog pranced and danced around the bottom, and far up above Bungo shut his eyes and dug his claws into the wood and wished very hard indeed that he was just a young Womble again and safe deep inside the burrow. Grrr, said the Dalmatian, pawing at the tree trunk. Come here, Fred, said the Dalmatian's owner, striding across the grass towards the bench, where Orinoco was now gently snoring. Much to Bungo's relief, the Dalmatian shook his head and then reluctantly retreated to where its owner was about to sit down on the bench. Bungo parted the leaves and watched with his mouth open as he remembered great Uncle Bulgaria's words of warning about mixing with human beings. There was a terrible story that once, long, long ago, a Womble had been taken away by some men and had never been seen again. What had happened to him? Nobody knew. And Bungo shivered so hard as he remembered this awful tale that the leaves shook gently. Lovely morning, sir, said the man, sitting down and hanging on tightly to his dog's collar to stop it from sniffing around Orinoco's ankles. Zzzz, said Orinoco sleepily. He was dreaming of breakfast and scratched his stomach contentedly at the thought of food. The man moved away slightly, pulling his dog with him. The dog whined and showed his teeth, and Bungo trembled so violently that some leaves drifted down off the tree. A very mild autumn we're having, the man said. <sniffs> said Orinoco, licking his lips as a picture of blackberries and cream slid before his eyes. Well, I must be getting along, said the man rather nervously. <sniffs> it's a strange noise, especially when made by a stranger. Oof said Orinoco, blowing out his cheeks and having a really good scratch. Nice meeting you, the man said. Come along then, Fred. And he caught hold of the Dalmatian's collar and pulled him away and went off very quickly without looking back. It wasn't until he was quite out of sight that Bungo slid down the tree and then, still feeling rather shaky, went over to Orinoco and nudged him. Whoa, whoa, sir, said Orinoco, sitting bolt upright. Oh, here's you again. What a restless creature you are. Isn't it breakfast time yet? Where's my hat? On your head, said Bungo. Weren't you frightened of that man and his dog? Man? What man? Dog? What dog? said Orinoco, yawning. Then he took off his sunglasses and looked at Bungo, and his eyes weren't at all sleepy, as he added. When I've got these spectacles on, there's a lot I don't see. Although, I'm not saying that I miss much, such as young wombles who run away from dogs. But, said Bungo, shuffling his paws. Or, said Orinoco, picking up his stick, I might notice that my tidy bag's rather empty, while somebody else's basket seems quite full. But, 
said Bungo, and then stopped and thought for a bit. And then he sighed and picked up his basket and began to take out some of the things and to put them in the bag. Nothing like a nice nap in the sun to make you feel fit, said Orinoco, shutting his eyes again. That evening, Toby Mori went along to have a good night chat with Great Uncle Bulgaria, who was just finishing the back page of The Times. Sit down, sit down, said Great Uncle Bulgaria, pushing over the stool. Toby Mori sat down and spread out his paws to the electric fire. Nothing to read in the paper these days, said Great Uncle Bulgaria, hitching his tartan shawl more firmly around his shoulders. Well, how's young Bungo? Silly name that. How's he coming along? He'll do, said Tobermory, and smiled to himself behind his paws. Thinks he's the greatest womble in the world at the moment, but he'll soon get that knocked out of him, one way or another. He's young yet, said Great Uncle Bulgaria, and for a moment the two wise old wombles looked at each other. And then Great Uncle Bulgaria got out the chess game, which he and Tobermory had been playing for years and years, and quite soon both of them had forgotten all about Bungo. And as for Bungo himself, he was fast asleep with a happy smile on his face, for he was dreaming that he was chasing an enormous black and white Dalmatian clean across Wimbledon Common, while all the other Wombles watched him admiringly. So, what have we learnt about the characters so far? We know that Orinoco is lazy. Um, we know that Bungo thinks he's brave, but maybe he isn't quite as brave as he thinks he is. We know that Tobermory is the Womble who likes to fix things and mend things. And we know that Great Uncle Bulgaria is the oldest Womble who is in charge of all the other, other Wombles. And the last character we have met is Tomsk, who was the Womble who was sitting in the doorway to make sure he knows which Wombles have gone out and which Wombles are still in.